Cherokee Nation and are, are behind us, right? You know, everybody's just like putting their feet up and uh, having a good time, right? So like I got the, yeah, I got the uh, vacation, you know, gear on and we're, uh, we're ready to just, you know, call the year done and we're finished. Unfortunately, for the rest of the world, including the bad guys, that's far from true. Um, this is the time of the year where you really got to get, you know, make sure you got all your, your, your things done right, or else that's when bad things happen. If, apparently on holidays, if, if you follow the trend, yeah. before we get too deep into all of that, do some quick housekeeping and then we'll get into some good conversation. So obviously we do this Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, every week, uh, one o'clock Eastern time. This is all recorded. You'll find that at mspinitiative.com under sessions, every session we've ever recorded since day one, which is about March, 2020. And we all know what happened then until now is there. Um, secondly, we have our monthly giveaway, right? So these are a group of vendors that come together, including uh, our friend who's on the line, which we'll introduce shortly. Uh, basically, just throw your name in the hat and you, you literally have one in 10 chance to win, assuming only 10 people uh, submit, but hopefully more than that, but you have pretty good odds, better than the lottery, um, and it's not rigged. So so there's that. Uh, <laughs> lastly, we, we just finished our MSP Community Block Party in Orlando last week. As you can see, we have all of uh, all of the stuff on there. So if you go there, you see a little video recap. You can hit all the photos from the event and, you know, just kind of relive or, or FOMO, for, for that matter, uh, why you weren't there. Uh, it is all there, uh, and you can enjoy some good, some good laughs. So uh, all of that is there. Uh, we have some stuff coming up that we're planning for next year. We're not ready to talk about that yet, but stay tuned. There is stuff planned, and it's not a bus, although the bus was fun. Uh, hopefully, we don't need a bus in 2022. That is this guy's hope right here, and probably Sade, who's behind the scenes, who probably doesn't want to see another bus ever again. So um, that being said, uh, here we are today. Our special speaker for today, uh, without further ado, is going to be Mike from Graphis. I'm going to let Mike intro himself, give you a little bit of his background, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into some good conversation. Well, some people call me Mike, but my actual name is Miles. That's what I like to go by. Yeah, I call you Mike Miles. My bad, man. You know Miles. what? You know what? I, I'm guessing you called me Mike because uh, my resemblance to Michael Jordan. I get that. That happens all no, the time. No, that, that, that isn't <laughs> it. That isn't it. I apologize. I should have I should have not been reading three things at once, but sorry. Miles. No, all, go all good. It. Everyone on, um, what's it called? Predictive text. Miles turns into Mike. Yeah. So I have been called Mike probably four times a week since 2007. So but, I'm Miles, but, Ma but Miles is such a good name. You know, when I think Miles, I, I'm going to, I'm going to not really dating myself. I just watched a lot of TV when I was a kid. Sure. I think of Knight Rider. Yeah, of course. I think of Miles from Knight Rider. Well, well, uh, well. What's what's Martin Lawrence's best movies from the two thousands? What what movie? Uh, Come on, I'm Bad Boys you. One. Before, uh, just after that. Um, what it, was it, just it, it? It matches the color behind you. Oh, um. Go ahead, tell me the name. I'm missing it. Blue Streak. Blue Streak. Okay. Yeah. So there's, right. there's not many Miles's out there. I know uh, Baby Driver, that movie that came out a couple years ago. Oh, he dude, was that Miles. was great. I love Baby oh, Driver. Love that movie. So, and uh, I'm so actually, good. I'm Miles Walker the ninth, if you can believe it. So there are a few of us out there. Oh, my man. dad is the eighth. We go back a couple years. So there you go. You, you guys just like really love the name. So you keep it going, huh? Uh, I, I don't know if we really love the name or all of our family that are males are just really lazy. Uh, I see. <laughs> It's just a checkbox. Keep it the same way. Keep it rolling. Exactly. I mean, it just makes all the paperwork a lot easier, right? It does. It does. Except I'll, I'll give you one quick story. Then we'll hop into this. When I tried to get my first mortgage, they wouldn't give me a mortgage because they're like, you have no credit because they had mixed up the Canadian government. They're not known for doing everything right. And uh, they had mixed up my dad's social insurance number uh, with my name and I couldn't get a mortgage. And it took eight weeks to uh, wow. deal with that. But anyways, all right. Well, I got a quick funny story on that. I know somebody had the same name as a MLB player. Yep. And so he started getting this guy's checks in the mail. Yeah. And I was just like, what did you do? Did you cash them? Did you send them back? He's like, they weren't small, I assume. He's like, no, definitely not. He was the general manager of like a local Red Robin restaurant down the street. Sure. Nelson Figueroa was the guy's name. And like there was a Nelson Figueroa playing baseball at the time. And I was like, that's funny. Wow. Well, I know 
there's there's a famous Miles Walker as well in uh, in, in Atlanta, and he he's a music producer for Beyonce, uh, Big Pun, and a bunch of the old like uh, big rappers from the '90s, 2000s. And uh, often people reach out to me wanting to collaborate, and I have to tell them sadly that I'm not in the music biz, but it's pretty tempting. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> yeah, I I would think so. I would think so. I, I would be, it would be interesting to see what other options come up to you, but yeah, great yeah. name. And yeah, like I said, uh, Knight Rider was, uh, is one of my go-tos. I know a lot of people, even my age are like, what's that? I'm like, how do you not know? But okay. Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, everybody, everybody's in a different place. So you're in Canada. It sounds like. Yeah. I mean, I'm in Vancouver. We actually have just had, I don't know if you've heard, I mean, pretty much all the Pacific Northwest has been hit by some crazy storms. Like we have had, about 30,000 people lose power. There's been quite a few deaths, sadly. And they're like parts of our city are completely devastated. And I know that's the same in Seattle and parts wow. of uh, Oregon as well. So I'm, I'm downtown right now. So like I'm sitting pretty, but I know a lot of my friends, like they've all been evacuated. They're in hotels for the next couple of weeks. So it's been pretty brutal here. And uh, it's starting to get a little cold up here. And it's, it's always rainy in Vancouver. They call it Raincouver for a reason. But, wow. Uh, I had, yeah. n- honestly, I'm not going to lie. I had no clue that any of that was happening, but that just goes to show you, you know, mother nature's on her own, on her own schedule. I thought it was just hard enough getting across the border. I, I know you were over for um, the, you know, Kaseya's connect it conference, right. Not that long ago. And, and I know how hard it is to, you know, or he, I hear how hard it is to get, you know, across now. Uh, yeah. But no, I had no idea that there was like a whole disaster zone happening. Yeah, it's been bad. I mean, like I've been like, I got a lot of good buddies that I grew up with who live in Seattle and they're messaging me like, is this go- going on up your way? Because it's only two hours away. And I'm like, yeah, it's been bad. Like flood levels have been crazy. But uh, but you know what? The border's opening up now. I mean, I got to see you in Vegas, which was awesome, even though we didn't have we didn't get to have a lot of beers together. We had a good catch up. And uh from now on, they're looking at taking away this crazy PCR test that every Canadian needs to have before we come back. They're looking to pull that. So they've just, they've just told us if you go down for less than three days, uh, you don't need a PCR test. So we're looking to push the government to say, hey, let's scrap that whole thing so then we can come down and visit our uh, American friends. I, I fully support this. This is great news. And they should get rid of that test. In my I, I agree. And we don't have a lot of COVID up here. We're doing pretty well. So uh, we want to come down and uh, celebrate with you guys. That's why I wasn't in Orlando. It just, it's been hard to travel the last couple months and things are starting to open, but um, you know, 2022, we're looking forward to it. Dude, that t- totally makes sense. Totally agree. And, and yeah, I've been saying, I hope 2022 uh, is going to be more like 20, tw- 2019 than anything else. Cause I think we're ready for it. We're ready for things to kind of, you know, get better to, to the point where we can like just put the whole thing behind us, leave it in the history book and, and kind of move on. That's, that's my hope, but uh, Hey, you know, we'll find out. I mean, we're starting to hear that people are, are starting to lock down uh, in Europe in certain countries. And um, you know, if that's any inclination that, of what could be coming um, not, not good sign, but I, hopefully we're in a different place here in North America. And um, they just, I mean, it was funny. I know guys, I was talking to a guy from the UK, great guy, uh, name is Austin Clark, um, MSP in the UK. And he was like, hey, you know, I booked my flight and I booked it two days before the United States opened up travel to international travelers who aren't, you know, you know, who aren't citizens. So I was like, so what were you going to do? Like sleep in the customs and border zone for like two days. And then, you know, then once he realized that he, he switched his flight uh, you know, to the, you know, to it was the eighth, it was the day before um, the comp, you know, IT nation in Orlando kicked off and, um, yeah, a bunch of people from Europe came over for that. And, you know, it was just finally nice to see, right. Like, you know, those people out and about, cause you're, we're over, you, we usually go over there uh, a bunch, but, uh, man talk about FOMO, right. I mean, so many people from down in Oz, right. Australia, New Zealand, were just like totally foaming at the mouth on all the pictures, photos that came out of, you know, some of these conferences. And I just feel really bad for those guys cause they're great. And um, they're a little bit on lock. Well, they, they just uh, opened up the border about three weeks ago for Oz. So they can all come. Like I had one of my good friends from Australia just flew up here. Yeah. About two weeks, two or three weeks ago. So they're, but can, they're they, but can they go back? That's the problem. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it's no problem. So they basically, okay. they've kind of taken, I guess, cause we're all part of the Commonwealth here, Canada, um, you know, New Zealand, Australia, they followed our model. And they said, if you have been vaccinated, you can travel now. 
and you just have to show a negative test when you come back into Oz within three days. So, you know what, that's going to be great for them. I got a lot of family down there. Um, I haven't been down there since 2018 and uh, you know what, they're going to be traveling, which is great. Cause Aussies, you always want a good Aussie or a Kiwi at a party. Cause they, oh, like, yeah. to drink, they like to have fun. They're worldly. They're great. But, but, but I, I warn you, make sure the credit card has a high limit on it. Cause they can surely drink. Oh yeah. They can, they can drink me under the table. I mean, I was born in England, so I've got, I've got some British kidneys on me so I can, I can go toe to toe. I actually see uh, some people are chiming in, in the chat. I see Keith Nelson there. We, uh, we met in San Antonio back in August and uh, we basically had uh, quite the night out together, which was awesome. So I'm guessing you've met Keith at some stage. Oh yeah. I mean, I caught Keith on the tail end of a, of a channel strong stop in, uh, in Orange County. You know, of course, Keith's problem is he's always so busy at that port in LA that's backed up with like 200 boats. You know, he just doesn't have time to play like he used to. For sure. He's a little bit, he's a little bit tied up. And we're not, you got to get those boats freed up, man. Figure out the log jam. You're a smart guy. Clear it up. We're not going to talk about his choice of NFL teams either because I don't approve of that. No, 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 no. I mean, like what we thought was going to happen there happened, right? You know, (laughs) the, 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 you know, the aforementioned team, right? I mean, you know, the guy comes out, he's all healthy, he's ready to go, bam, down. I know another guy that used to do that. We called him Mr. Glass. You know who that was? Tony Romo. Same thing. It's a curse. Oh, Romo. I like him on TV, though, now. I like him on TV. Yeah, now listen, he doesn't get, get, yeah, like, if he gets hurt sitting in the chair, that's a whole different problem, okay? (laughs) But, like, on the field, right, like, he got hurt. He always got hurt in Philadelphia. Actually, Philadelphia ended a lot of people's runs uh, in, 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 in football. But, hey. There, there was a place called the vet and uh, it was pretty much, you know, playing on concrete for quite some time, but it, you know, Tony Roma got hurt in the new stadium on grass for whatever it's worth. I'm not trying to give him any less or more credit than he deserves, but yeah, good analyst. Uh, definitely uh, for a second there when, uh, when Dak went down, <laughs> I thought they were going to call Tony and be like, Hey, uh, what are you doing today? But uh, it's okay. Hey, hey listen, man. Keith, it's all fun and games, right? But when was the last time Dallas won a Super Bowl? Did they stop playing after 95, 96? I think I, I so. Think it, I think it was earlier than that. But I no, mean, I think know. that was about right. I think they yeah. stopped playing after that. Yeah, a- they a- just like Aikman and Emmett. Yeah, well, uh, Romo's no Randall Cunningham. I got to say that, right? Exactly, exactly. Keith from my team's on here. He's like, Michael Irvin. That's exactly right. We ended Michael Irvin here in Philadelphia. Another good uh, historical Hall of Fame, Dallas Cowboy, uh, you know, as I name them by name. Although Keith, Keith likes to use... Anybody against America's team is from countries abroad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so, hey, listen, there's a long season left. Don't forget, people, 17 regular season games this year. Not 16, 17 plus expanded playoffs. Next year could be 18 regular season games, which if you're a, a ticket holder for any NFL team, may I add, who wants to pay for preseason games you can't even give them away pay full price and you're literally burning in your pocket so i'll take the regular season game to expand the roster out and call it a day anyway um so let's talk let's rewind vegas right so we're at we're at connect we are connect it in vegas um vegas is a an interesting place because you know people get distracted um do they? <laughs> by, do they? By, all, by all of the various things that you can do and um, I know I was walking down the hallway. Somebody said he had been in it. This is his eighth consecutive day in Vegas. So I was like, dude, is your bank account empty? Do you have a liver? And are you not hospitalized? You know, like something's he going probably, wrong there. He probably hasn't seen a piece of fruit in eight days either, because I don't know what it is with Vegas. You cannot find fruit or vegetables anywhere. And you go yeah, out for a desert. meal and just steaks and steaks and chicken wings. Oh yeah. It's a desert. They don't, they, you know, they can't grow it. They don't want to ship it in. You know, like uh, the rest of the stuff can be frozen. Right. Course, but anyway, um, yeah, interesting, uh, interesting event, right? Um, the Connect IT conference, the kind of first, you know, kind of big event since COVID, uh, kind of restart on your side. Um, lots of good content came out of it. Security, 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 still a huge focus. For sure. Uh, I actually was able to jump on a quick panel with um, uh, Robin Miller from IOTSA and a couple of the other kind of security geeks out there. Um, you know, and I kind of just jumped on there from an industry perspective, but, um, you know, we talked about the future of cybersecurity when it comes to MSPs and, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really scared, man. I'm really scared from a couple of reasons. One, you know, like 
you know, this AI thing, right, is, is for real, right? And like having the supercomputing power to do a lot of things really fast, that's going to change the game. Like, I'm not talking 10 years, 15, 20, I'm like three to five years, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's part of everything now. And that's what people don't realize. I mean, I was, uh, I mean, it's everything and it's small things that people don't think of. Like, um, you know, I was watching, I was watching the first episode of uh, Tiger King's new season yesterday. Oh, right? don't ruin it. Don't ruin it. Don't ruin I it. Because I, 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 I have to go watch it. I have to go watch it. Now, did they release the whole season? They're doing episode by episode. Oh, no, they gave us, they gave us the whole shabam. Okay. So. So, so for anyone that's, you know, not, who doesn't know what Tiger King is, like, come out of your cave, get out of your rock. Like you need to, <laughs> you need to go check that out. So apparently season two is like not going backwards. It said that all this extra footage from making season one. No, they would go forwards in time, right? They're trying to tell you what happened since the end of season one. So don't ruin it. I haven't watched I it. I know it's I out. It's I brand won't. new. It's probably only dropped like within the last day and a half. Right. But yeah, well, it, dropped, it dropped yesterday and uh, okay. I watched episode one and this is what's so weird is that obviously yeah, they know that I watched the first one, right? And I'm actually going to, there haven't been many events in Canada because we've been shut down. A lot of the American bands haven't been able to get in. So I'm actually going to um, Tiger King Live next month where they're bringing everybody except for Joe Exotic and Carol. And they're going to do like an open forum chat. So I bought tickets. But what I'm getting at is this AI technology uh, to bring it all back home. Um, you know, I'm getting stuff now on my Instagram. I'm getting stuff on my Facebook all about Tiger King because, you know, everything is connected, right? So, I, I mean, I've had this three or four times in the last while where I'd be talking about something and then, you know, a couple hours later on my Instagram feed or on my Facebook feed, an ad pops up for what I was talking about. And so this AI technology, it's everywhere. Um, I mean, I know when I listen to my Apple Music now, it tells me what they know I'm going to like because of what I already have liked in the past. And these, this AI technology is crazy, but it's definitely here and it's here to stay. But the original AI was Kit. Oh yeah. Captain Knight Rider. Okay? Of course, of course. They may have gotten the Tesla part right. They may have gotten all that stuff right, but still I don't have Kit. And if I don't have Kit talking to me, they, they missed it. They seriously well, missed it. Here, here's, what, here's a crazy one. I read an article a couple of weeks back about um, a guy who was driving just outside of uh um, Silicon Valley. So wherever that is in San Francisco. And, uh, he was driving and a cop pulled up because the car, um, had made a couple weird, uh, lane changes and the police got up to the car, looked in and there's nobody in the car. And so he pulled in front of the Tesla and it slowed down. The car pulled off. And one of the, the tech, I don't know, millionaires, billionaires, whatever it is, was asleep in the driver's seat. And he had set it to his address and he'd gone to bed. And so the AI technology took over, was driving him. And that's not legally allowed yet at this point. Mm -hmm. And he got in trouble. He got a ticket. And this is something that's actually here now. Like this isn't like five or 10 years away. These self-driving cars are here and they're using this AI technology and they're actually working. Well, I can't wait till, you know, I, I, I was always one of these guys who get stuck in traffic. And I, you know, I do, I did a lot, I still do a lot of driving right in the Northeast here where you can like go in between the pot. You now here's, here's a trivia question for you. I, I do this all the time and I'll continue with my story. Sure. What percentage of the population of the entire United States of America are in between Northern Virginia, Boston, and Pittsburgh, Northern Virginia, Boston, and Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah. You know, that I 95 corridor. We call Okay. It so what percentage of the population of the entire United States live in that triangle. So you got you got about 330, 335 million people. I'll go with 40%. You're exact almost exactly spot on 41%. Oh, no way. Yes. <laughs> yes. Really? Price is right. So okay, you didn't okay. go over. So well, um I'm gonna I'm gonna battle you with one of mine then. So okay. you, you know All how right. many people live in Canada? I have no clue. Okay, it's about about 38 million or so. So 37, 38 million. Um, what percentage of our country is within 160 miles of the U.S. border? What percentage? 94%. It's like 80 to 85%. Okay. So you're very close. But yeah, yeah like, so like, like, like once you get past, like, once you get past a certain level in Canada, like, unless you're in the oil business, like, I don't understand what you're doing. Oh, there's no point. I, I've gone up there and you're like, what is the point of being up here? I mean, I know 
I don't know if you guys heard, but Canada was playing. I mean, we're in the CONCACAF right now for the soccer championships. And mm -hmm. surprisingly, we're number one right now. Uh, USA and Mexico are tied for second, I believe. And we played Mexico this week in Edmonton. And what we do in these tournaments, this is so devilish of us, but I love it. We brought up, you know, the Mexican team arrived in. We decided to play them in Edmonton. It was minus 14 degrees. There was snow on the field and they had to shovel it off. And guess what? We beat Mexico for the first time in 55 years. Because they're, not, they're not built for that temperature. Minus I, I mean, 15, it's freezing. Well, see, you know, back to, back to NFL, you know, America football, uh, not America's team, but America's football, because uh, obviously there's football. But yeah. um, there is a benefit to these teams that have open air stadiums, right? Like when it does get cold, that is part of the benefit. Not negative 15 cold, I hope, you know, like, but when it, get, when it gets cold, when it gets windy, when it gets snowy, that's a benefit to somebody who's playing inside of a dome, right? Sure. Uh, sure. Like somebody else we know on the line. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, there's certain things that shouldn't happen in negative temperatures. You know what one of those things is? The Super Bowl should never be in a cold weather city. I don't know what they thought. They're like, oh, I'll put up a new stadium in, in the North Pole. We'll have a Super Bowl there. No, stop. Well, I had to go, I had to go to Minnesota to go to an Eagles, Eagles Patriots Super Bowl in 2017. And it was negative degrees. I still had to get to the stadium that's enclosed, but negative temperatures, I'm out. So, so, so yeah, because I would say like it is, it's not open air though, Minnesota, right? No, I know, but you I know still have to get to the building. Yeah, yeah, which is minus 30 outside or whatever, because I know. It was crazy. My, my they, had, first... they had ice sculptures outside, and it was cold enough to keep the ice sculptures going the wow. whole week. Wow. Because I was going to say, my first, uh, my first NFL game, I, when I was living in Toronto, I drove down from Toronto to Buffalo, and about a third of the Buffalo fans are from Toronto because it's only an hour and a half drive. And it had to be minus 10. And luckily the beer kept us warm because it was freezing in that outside stadium. Well, until your beer starts freeze freezing. Yeah, exactly. It can happen. I've seen this. Really? Now, when your liquor starts freezing, you're really in trouble. For sure. For sure. Bad news, man. Does it get Bad cold really? Well, once you get to like January and February. Yeah. Like, like if you're in an a NFC championship game in Philadelphia in February, in, uh, in, uh, late January, it's going to be cold. Okay. It's going to be, it could be negative temperatures cold for sure. Wow. But not like green Bay or Buffalo cold. No, usually not. If it's, if it's that cold here in Philadelphia, like they're completely frozen up there to never do anything ever again. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Which comes back to technology, right? Which, you know, is, is the, the Achilles heel, but also the savior, right? Like, you're saying, hey, the, the West Coast getting hit by all these storms. We're talking about snow and ice. Um, yeah. Obviously, we had a couple of big internet outages. Uh, I, I think all of Google Cloud went down uh, this past week. Um, they, I don't know if they've released an RFO for it, but um, yeah, like Google, Google, Google Cloud, anything on Google Cloud, there's a bunch of big names on there went down. Okay. Uh, and then Comcast and Verizon, two pretty big names in internet uh, and, and telco here in the U.S., uh, both that, you know, basically within a day of each other had uh, Verizon Fios had an outage. Comcast had almost a nationwide outage. Um, you know, like, so we have very reliant on these technologies to work remotely, right? And obviously when it's, you know, the cool part about keeping people spread out is there's a little bit of redundancy, right? You hope not everywhere, everybody everywhere is down. Mm -hmm. um, but having everybody dispersed and having everybody on, you know, you know, kind of like their own island, which seems to be now the, the idea, right? Because going into 2022, I think a lot of people are going to go back to the office, but a good chunk of people are not. I know a lot of the big companies say you never have to come back again, um, which I was surprised of in a lot of instances. Uh, sure. if, you, if you ask me, right, like there's a certain thing that you lose by not being in a group, right? But obviously it can happen. I, you know, we've all seen that. But it also makes things... Philly is not in the United States. I promise you it is. I promise <laughs> you my, I promise you the United States post office delivers mail here. I, I do. I promise. Don't, um, listen, but anyway, don't listen to Keith. Don't listen to Keith. I, I, I know. It's just, it's fun. It's fun. So um, um, back to, but the security thing's starting to creep up, right? So again, you know, I feel like what's happening now, uh, and I'm sure there's sophisticated stuff out there happening, but the majority of what we're hearing is, is, is happening because 
a human being didn't really think about what they were doing and they just did it, did something. Right. And then yeah, they opened up Pandora. Right. And we can train people until, you know, you can't talk anymore and you're blue in the face, but I just feel like there's no hundred percent to get your, an entire staff of somebody. And this was my argument at the panel at, at, uh, at connect it. Sure. We're having a heart. We're seeing a lot of people with, you know, I'm hiring signs out a lot, a lot from every level, right? They literally cannot fill these positions. Um, and this is not the same problem from 2019, right? Like these people just aren't working. Okay. So you're literally having to lower your barrier to just take anyone in a lot of instances that may be a square peg round hole into a position. And the person behind that keyboard screen and, and uh, mouse I mean, it could be, it could be just, Hey, I just need somebody to run the cash register. Right. They're not going to, you know, really think deeply right now, extrapolate that to a business environment, right? Like it could be the lowest common denominator in your chain is somebody's answering the phone and is a receptionist, right. Or somebody at that lower level, right. Like you can train all of those people to you, to you, you can't train them no more. They may just not care or have the aptitude to just pick up on these things, right. From a security standpoint. And all it takes is one person to create a big problem for any organization. I think you bring up some great points. And uh, one of them is that, um, you know, these cyber attacks that are happening these days, um, uh, over 50%, this is the first time ever that over 50% of cyber attacks are now against small and medium sized businesses. So what does that mean? These large scale businesses, the, uh, you know, the Googles, the Microsofts, they have security training in place that they're doing every month. They have phishing solutions already in place. They have secure email gateways. They have these tools that are there to defend them and their workers. You know who doesn't have those tools? The small and medium-sized businesses. You mentioned uh, someone who's just running the cash register. You know what they all always get? Doesn't matter what their job is, they still get an email from the company. And those people haven't been trained in looking at sophistic- uh, sophisticated phishing email. So they have not been trained on that and they probably won't ever get trained. They also don't really know how their tech works. They have an email. Everyone just gets an email when they arrive. They almost give them out willy nilly. And you know what? The cyber attackers know this. Why would you go after, um, you know, the tech guy in a small company when you can go after, you know, like you said, the the cashier, one of the new receptionists, a part-time worker. I mean, all this stuff's on LinkedIn as well. This is the, what's so crazy. I mean, you go to, um, I'm just looking out my window right now. I have a parking lot across the street in a small printing company that I'm looking at right now. That small printing company has five people. You could go on their website, see the names of those people, click on them and send off an email because it actually lists their email on the website or on LinkedIn. It's, you know, uh, Mike at printplus.com. I can't believe I used the word Mike again, but there you go. And, you know, you click on Mike at printplus.com, you go to LinkedIn, you find out that Mike is a part time cashier or receptionist. Mm-hmm. He's the one who you want to target because as a cyber attacker, you know that this guy's not getting, you know, uh, training in place. He just shows up, punches his card, and leaves. And that's why a lot of these companies are having breaches. A hundred percent. And so you make a good point on one side, which is we're volunteering a lot of information online to be used against us. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and you just may not realize it until after the fact, but a lot of that information on social media on, on how we're presenting information online and just open, like basically opening the window and saying, here we go. It's what it's right here uh, or front door for that matter. Um, that is being used against us. Number one, the same way that marketers, scrape these tools for sales and marketing efforts i see the bad guys scraping these tools to try and use that information against you for whatever ends up being the thing that hurts the most right so that's number one number two when you're talking to the owner or decision maker of that small business the challenge that you're trying to get across to them is hey you know this could totally ultimately be such a, a problem for you in the end that you may you may actually go out of business on the flip side, they're like, listen, like I'm running a bakery, right? I need to be able to do the job. I, you know, like if you make it so complicated for me and I got to go through all of these barriers, right? This concept of zero trust, all this, whatever, to just even get to the point where I can start doing my job, I'm not going to do it. Totally. 
I'm not going to do it. I, I, I just unplug it from the wall. I'll figure it out later. You know, like that's kind of sort of the problem, isn't it? That all of these layers that you have to put in place create such a learning curve and such a multi-step process to even get back to the point where you can work that people just don't do it. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I, I had one recently. So I was mentioning earlier, my friend who got in from Australia for the first time in two years, she called me up probably six to nine months ago. And she's like, can we talk? I'm like, yeah, sure. What's up? And uh, she had her local CrossFit gym got, uh, had a cyber attack. And she's like, can you help me? And I'm like, that's, we do, we have solutions in place to stop that. We don't go in after and like negotiate with the terrorists right? If we can call them terrorists. And I, I mean, said, I, I, I say they are, I think they absolutely are. They are. And uh, I said, no, that's not what we do. And I said, you know, good luck. Um, but you know, he's, he's going to be in trouble. And he ended up paying, I think he paid a $7,000 ransom. And that doesn't seem like a lot. And for a CrossFit gym, you know what, he's still in business, I found out, but those were obviously a couple lean months. That was maybe his whole profit that month. And or yeah. maybe even for two months. But um, th this is what I'm getting at is that these cyber criminals don't care that you're a CrossFit gym that has seven inboxes or 10 inboxes. They know that you're, you're not educated. You don't have cyber solutions in place. You don't have anti-phishing solutions in place. And you're easy. You're the low hanging fruit. And, you know, you can go and go after a, you know, a medium sized business that maybe has two or 300 workers, but they probably have some tools in place, but that little CrossFit gym doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really just, I mean, the best way to say it is you almost need to understand that there's going to be an event at some point, right? Like, I, I, to, you know, I, I feel like there's this stigma around, you know, hey, you've been breached. Well, it's like, well, everybody's going to be there, right? It's only a matter of how, how deep does that hurt? It's risk mitigation, right? You're never going to be able to block all of that 100%. And I think the challenge also is, you know, what is the lowest hang, what is the lowest denominator, right? For everyone, right? I know, you know, everybody says, oh, the insurance companies. Yeah, I mean, they're making it, you know, like, hey, you got to at least have MFA on. You got to, you know, I get it, right? Like lowest, you know, like ro password rotations and and just, you know, basic security hygiene. Um, but I think the challenge ultimately becomes like, there is no, you know, and Keith mentioned it earlier in the theme, right? Legislation, legislation, legislation. Sure. I mean, all legislation is going to do is going to impose some sort of penalty against you, right? I mean, that's not net, like, you know, some people may look at the penalty and say, eh, like, I, you know, I hate to say it. I'm sure we all have, right? We use the word like HIPAA and these other places, right? HIPAA is a good one where you go into a dentist's office or a one, a solar practitioner on a doctor's office, whatever. And they're like, eh, I'm too small. They're not going to look at me. And they're like, pretty sure they don't care whether you're one or a thousand, right? You're all treated the same. So I, I totally agree, George. I, I did, um, I did two keynotes last week at our first uh, Vancouver tech event um, since 2020. And uh, I, I didn't like how they scheduled me back to back because I did a 45 minute talk on ransomware and phishing and the connection. And then right after it, 50 minutes later, I did a 30 minute talk on ransomware and phishing. And so I had 40, I think 41 people come to my first session and four came to the second. And out of the second session, two of those four were like, oh, we liked your first session. We want to hear what you're talking about now. And I'm like, well, I'm just making a condensed version because I had a 45 minute and a 30 minute. And right. I actually said in the, in the first um, um, session I did, I said, who has had one of these um, buy an Amazon, Amazon gift card attack in the last year? Because I was telling them a story that I had one happen against me in my last role where my boss reached out to me. And funnily enough, I was actually sitting uh, in the room with him, George, doing a marketing, a marketing talk on projects. And I got an email come in while he's sitting across from me. And, you know, we hadn't talked for a minute or two because we were working on stuff. And the email said, hey, bro. And I'm like, that's how he talks right? It said, hey, bro, um, he is the president of the company, but it's a small company of 10 people, right? So he said, hey, bro, um, I want to do something nice for everybody because COVID has been so bad. Can you go buy 10 gift certificates um, from Amazon for 100 bucks each? Don't tell our accounting department, which is his wife. Um, and I want to give them, 
I want to give them out to everyone at lunch um, as a surprise because it's just before Christmas. And I was like, that's really cool. My buddy, good dude. Like, you know, I know he struggled with his business, but that's, that's pretty awesome. And I said, you know what, what you did was great. And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, I just got your email and it had his signature. It came from his email. Um, it said, Hey bro. And that's how he talks. And, uh, he's like, show me the email. I turned around my computer and he's like, Oh my God. And he knew he had a business email compromise. And I actually told that story. And I said, has anyone in the room had this happen to them? And three people out of 41 put up their hand. And I said, what happened? And out of those three people, two of them ended up getting duped and paying. And this it's is such a, it's such a simple thing. Yeah. And I mean, you know, out of 67% of the people that I talked to had had this happen had actually got fooled by it and bought these Amazon gift cards from a link. And this is what people are doing. It's like, yeah, you can go and try and hit a big company, but you know what, if you send that email out to 40 or 50 businesses, you know, a bunch of them are going to hit it. And, uh, you know, there goes the money. It's amazing how simple it is. And, and, and frankly, along that line is the, the email that you get and they're like, Hey, you know, we're, we're your vendor, right? They make it look, they make it look right. Right. The, the logos and the names, Hey, we've changed where you need to wire us money or send us money. Can you change your ACH or your wiring instructions to this versus that? Um, and then all of a sudden a month later, you're getting a call saying, hey, you're, you're past due. And they're like, what are you talking about? And you find out that 30 days ago, you, you got spoofed, right? Somebody yeah. convinced you to send money somewhere else that, you know, and you had no clue. And you know who they hit. They don't usually hit the tech team or the finance team. They'll go through the receptionist and say, hey, you know, I know, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have a little bit of information, kind of like a spear phishing email. And they'll have a little bit of information on the receptionist. And you'd be amazed what you can find. I mean, I had one this week and I, I played around with him a little bit because I knew it was a, a fake mail, but he actually had a LinkedIn page, a legit LinkedIn page. I took the guy's name, went to his LinkedIn page and he said, hi, Miles, um, you know, your, um, your account, no, it wasn't your account. It was your invoice hasn't been paid for the event. And I was going to click on the attachment. And then I was like, whoa, 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 who is this guy? And then I replied back. I said, hey, and uh, I, you know, use his name. What, what is this for? And he said, oh, just click on in. It's all the details there. If someone wants to get paid, like say I owed you $7,000 from an event, George, and you sent me a, a message and I replied back, like, what is this? You would say this was from IT Nation, Channel Pro, whatever the event was we were working on together. You wouldn't say just click on in. And I went back and forth with him four times just to see what info I could get out of him. But I looked at his LinkedIn page. He looks like a legit person. And that's what's so crazy. And I don't know how he got my email, but it just shows you can do anything. This, this is the problem, right? Like anyone can set up a catfish you know, profile, right? They steal photos. They, 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 they just, they make it the same name, right? And then they just change the email address. And then you think, you know, you think that you're talking to that person. It's just, it's just amazing how just these little simple things, um, I, this is a complex stuff. I mean, if somebody really wanted to get, I mean, obviously you're here and they can potentially find you versus in another country where they can't come and get you. But if somebody wanted to be malicious, it's not that hard um, to do some of this stuff. It's really low level stuff. Um, well, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. And I mean, I know I, I talk a lot in my, in when, I, when I'm doing my keynotes and my talks and my webinars that you can actually buy fishing kits now on the dark web. And this has been going on for about 18 months. And I Fishing as a service. Sorry? Fishing as a service. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, you can go on. There's about 700 domains you can buy that are, you know, they look legit. And people are doing this now. I mean, I, I could tell you how many we've seen. I mean, Canada, we have a thing called a CRA. So that's how we pay our taxes. And recently, well, in 2020, um, attackers actually breached the CRA. And they were sending out fake CRA accounts to people because you know, we're, uh, we're a little bit of a socialist country up here. We got some, uh, some decent handouts from uh, the government when people lost their jobs during COVID and people were collecting these checks. And, um, you know, simple, you're collecting a check for $2,000, whether you actually were working beforehand or not, you were getting this money. So if you're, if you're some guy who probably hasn't been working, you get an email from the government saying, hey, um, you know, we've had issues, we've had a, and they'll actually use a compromise 
to get you to get compromised. They'll say, we had a compromise in our system and a lot of our banking details have failed. You need to input your banking details again so wow. we can send you your next check. And of course, if someone doesn't have the knowledge, they're going to input their banking details because the government's saying they want to pay me. That's crazy, but you're so right. So many people will do that. Yeah, I mean, I could I could tell you numerous ones. I mean, recently we have a province in the far, far east, so kind of like directly northwest from you called Newfoundland, which is this beautiful Finland, place. Yeah. And uh, Newfoundland. And they're, in, they're in their own time zone. They have, well, this is unbelievable. So you guys are on, are you guys East Coast time right now? Yes, Italy? New York East Coast time, yeah. And then Halifax is is one hour um, in front of you. And Correct. Newfoundland is an hour and a half in front of you. What's up with the half? It's stupid. I don't know. I've, ne I've been to Halifax and I kid you not. I was watching, I remember specifically watching the Dallas Mavs, Miami Heat. I guess it would have been 2011 finals. And I was in the bar at 1.45 a.m like cheering against LeBron because I wanted uh, Jason Kidd to win. And it was 1.30 in the morning. And I could barely see straight because I was so tired. I had a couple couple party pops as well. But it was 1.30 in the morning. You shouldn't be watching sports at 1.30 in the morning unless it's the World Cup or the Olympics in a different continent. Not by the way, yeah. by the way, totally agree. I was in uh, this past weekend on Sunday, uh, uh, Eagles at Broncos. I know, not, not in Dallas. Sorry, Keith. Eagles at Broncos. Uh, although Broncos went to Dallas the week before and caused some stir, but Eagles at Broncos in Denver, by the way, 70 degrees in De in Denver in November. I mean, psh, wow. who, who, uh, how are you going to plan for that? I, I always great weather, but like when they're, when they end their Sunday, when they end their night games and it's still like, you still have day left, right? Like the West coast people. So yeah. nice. Cause by the time you get to the end of the day on football on Sunday, it's pretty late and you're done here on the East coast. I mean, I the, the, like I've I've lived on both coasts, and the one thing I didn't like about living on the East Coast, like I I, I grew up as a big Phoenix Suns and Dallas Mavs fan. When I'm talking basketball, because such, such a Nash. weird such a weird combo for a guy from Canada, by the way. Well, because of Steve Nash, you know, when uh, yeah. our team got stolen away, the Vancouver Grizzlies ended up in Memphis, and so we follow some of our Canadian boys. And I remember living in Toronto, and those Phoenix Suns games would come on. They'd start between ten and ten thirty at night. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm not waiting up until one or two to find out if Steve Nash drops 10 assists, right? No, I'm out. And I mean, I'm I out. lived in London for five years and I remember getting up at three in the morning to watch the NBA All-Star game because that was the only game I would wake up for at 3 a.m. to watch. But it was brutal. Madness. Yeah, but anyway, Absolutely. back to Newfoundland. I didn't even yeah, uh, Newfoundland, you just yeah. go off on a tangent, but Newfoundland... Um, their whole health system got hacked this past week and was down for, I think, five or six days. So that means nobody could have surgery. So they had to cancel all these surgeries and they were actually using paper to fill out people's details. And Ireland had the same thing happen. So Ireland is a country of about 5 million. It seems way bigger than that. I mean, like where I live in Vancouver, we got almost 3 million people here. And Ireland, I mean, there's Irish people all over the world. And the whole country only has 5 million people. They had a hack against their, um, the Irish um, healthcare system. And it took weeks. And once again, what happens? Surgeries get postponed. The data often gets encrypted. And it was complete chaos. And they're going after people who already have solutions in place. Yeah, this is true. Did you hear about the FBI's email server this past week getting hacked? Remind me. They, so the FBI server got hacked and they used the server to start sending messages out to people, kind of similar to how you're saying your, your version of the IRS in Canada was sending messages to people saying, hey, there's a problem. You need to do this. They were sending this out to IP address holders, right? For ARIN. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and basically, they got into the FBI system. They started shooting these messages out about some infrastructure problem. And then basically trying, like, using the FBI's domain to basically get people to then trigger, a pro like, just push it downstream, right? They were going wide. Wow. And I was like, wait a minute. The FBI, the premier law enforcement agency in the world, and they can't even, you know, totally be protected, right? I, I did not hear that. And I watch my news every day and the Canadian news is so boring. So we mostly watch American news up here in Canada. Like I remember uh, about a year and a half ago watching the news and like the lead story was a dog jumped off one of our ferries and could they find the dog in the ocean? I'm like, this is not news. No, I'm not, I'm not taking away from dog lovers out there, but 
So, so we watch a lot of American news. So I'm, I'm surprised I missed here, that here, story here, right here, there. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Someone appears to have hacked the FBI server just for fun. At least that's what the hacker wants you to believe. And he's like, yeah, the hacked FBI system takes a lot of motivation, technical skill, blah, blah, blah. Over the weekend, a team of someone's compromised the FBI email server and sent a flurry of bogus messages to state and local law enforcement about a supposed cyber attack. But instead of trying to wreak havoc, the purpose of the hack seems to have been to troll one particular information <laughs> security executive, the founder and head of security research at Shadowbyte, or at least that's the version. Wow. wow. Well, this, this, what's so crazy about this is that um, – I, I don't think you've actually attended any of my sessions, but I get to do um, these events where I actually interview these thought leaders in the industry. And uh, in a couple weeks, I'm interviewing an ethical hacker uh, who goes by the that he goes by the name FC, which stands for Freaky Clown. And uh, he what he does is he actually gets paid by governments to go in and try and breach people like the FBI. He gets hmm. you know uh, large banks like Bank of America will hire him and be like break in do this and so and the reason why he's an ethical hacker now is he's had a little bit of a i'll go with checkered past let's say that so he's done the uh the the hard stuff in the uh in the past where basically the government comes to him and says listen we've got a great job for you or we have a great position for you in a prison what do you want and that's it's like what, a modern day version of catch me if you can well it is and i mean I, uh, I, I got to interview a guy named Tony Sales last month. And Tony Sales is known as Brit, uh, Britain's biggest fraudster. And he stole $50 million from companies all over Europe. And he basically ended up getting busted after running scams all over. And he was doing stuff like bank fraud, uh, mortgage scams. And then when the internet obviously came more became more prevalent, he started doing cyber scams because it was so easy to set up fake mortgage companies online. And, you know, he would start the process by saying, okay, you know, it's a hundred dollar fee just to get started. And then, you know, it's not hard to, to clone a real estate website or a mortgage company website. And he ended up getting busted. And it's just like, catch me if you can, because he ended up going to prison for about a year and a half for uh, passport fraud. That's the only thing they could find on him because, you know, there's not passport fraud. Wow. Yeah. And, and the thing is, he always, he said to me, I mean, he's got a book out, which is called the big con, which is like top of the, the bestseller list in the UK. And what's so interesting is that, um, you know, after all this, he went to pass, he, he got busted for passport fraud, but he, he said, miles, there's no um, computer in the world that's sitting in a prison cell right now. And so the people who are at the other end, they just don't get busted and they don't face jail time. And even when they do, it's very minimal. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, it's amazing. Like sometimes people go to jail for a long time for something that we're like, what? That doesn't even make sense. Right. It's like they didn't kill anyone, but then they went to jail longer than if they did or something like that. Right. But like the people who get away with a lot of these scams, uh, I remember back, you know, when I was in high school, I thought I was buying Eagles tickets on eBay. And it turned out that this guy had scammed like, like six or seven million dollars in twenty four hours on eBay, selling fake tickets to this playoff game. Yeah, you know, this oh. Philadelphia Eagles playoff game, and um, they eventually found the guy. And like, I was getting the letters from the Department of Justice saying, "Hey, you know, there's a hearing. You know, we're informing you because you're a victim to this that, and the other." And I was like, "Okay," but like, this is you know, even way back when, like eBay, right? I think like. You know, that's one of the original kind of marketplaces when, you know, when it really finally got going on the internet. I mean, they've been doing this since the internet was around, right? I mean, after, you know, Al Gore invented it or whatever, but, sure, you know, like, sure. but like, it's just so easy to con people because the cons that you would, like you said, to the guy that you were just mentioning, the, guy, the cons that you'd be doing in person are just easier online. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. And I mean, he, like, we, we've obviously spoken at length and we talked for about an hour, but we had some, some pre-calls before that. And the story is like, I'd be, I'm, like I said, I've been reading his book and how much work he was doing to actually do in-person cons. It was so much easier just doing it online. You hire a tech guy to clone a website, you pay him $20 an hour. He doesn't have to go out and case a bank rent apartments beside the bank, have buildings, have cars already. No, you can do that all very easily online these days. And with companies like 
Fiverr where you can pay some guy in, you know, uh, Eastern Europe or wherever to, to do work for you and you pay him 10 bucks an hour. I mean, these scams are, they're, they're getting crazy now. Um, I, I want to say the one that I find absolutely unbelievable is that, especially in the fishing world, um, one of the most popular areas where people are getting fished industry-wise is education. Hmm. And lots of people go, well, why, why education? And I, I hmm. always like to give, like bring it back in so people can understand. My girlfriend's a teacher and she has 2,200 kids at her school and 150 teachers. And in her, in her school district, there's 10 other schools. So, you know, work that out about 20,000 people and all those kids get an email nowadays. Okay. And every teacher gets an email. So that's 20,000 inboxes, right? Um, you know what those kids don't know a lot about cybersecurity. They don't, they're not taught it in school. And I guarantee in five to 10 years, um, that'll be something that kids are going to get taught in school. But right now um, they have one tech guy who looks after 10 schools. So he pops in every three weeks when she has an issue with her email, she reaches out to him. And I'll tell you this, he is an old school um, IT service provider or MSP or not even. He's just a guy with some tech skills and he comes in and helps with the basics. And he hasn't been uh, taught a lot of the skills he needs to know to deal with this stuff. And um, Austin, Texas, they had a cyber breach last year and they paid a $2 million ransom. And people had been in the Austin School, Texas system for over 18 months before they actually put in the, the ransomware because they were figuring out how they wanted to do it. So, I mean. It's amazing. You don't even think about this stuff until until the shoe drops and ends up a headline. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we th these are great stories, by the way, because they're real stories rather than hypotheticals, right? This stuff's actually happening, working backwards from a reality. Sure. Um, so, obviously, the company that you work for helps with this style of attack um obviously they've been acquired by kaseya for you know don't don't hold that against him anyone if you're not a kaseya fan he's still a really good guy and his company still does good stuff so tell us where where you help where your where, where your solution can help well we we work for office uh, we we protect against office 365 and g suite which um i just heard g suites changed their name now what is it google um, Google Work workplace. We're going to call it Google workplace now. So, um, we work against, um, on those two platforms and because we have this AI technology, um, when we, we embed ourselves in the system. So everyone often says to me, well, Miles, we have a secure email gateway and secure email gateways, as you know, have been around for, you know, 10 or 15 years. They haven't really evolved with the times because they don't actually protect when an email gets into the system. They stop stuff from, from coming in. But as we've quickly learned, they don't protect against every email. So um, we're, we're about 60% more, more reliable than a secure email gateway. But when those emails actually get in the system through the AI technology, this is where it gets a little crazy again. Um, the AI technology looks at about 50 different attributes um, on every email that comes in. So it figures it, out. So, is there even 50 things to look at? Like There are. There like are. A lot. And so like, George, like you've, you send me an email before. And the second I get that email from you, I'll get a banner that says, this is a potential phishing email. Um, you know, George Bardisi has never sent you an email before. And so they'll say, they'll put the banner up and they'll say, you can either report phishing or report a false positive. I know it's from you, so that's great. So I'll re report a false positive. But then, so next time you send an email, say you've actually had a compromised email, it's gonna figure that out because it'll look at the IP address. It'll look at several different things that are way more high level stuff than I talk about. Um, but through those 50 different attributes, it figures out a trust score, kind of like what, what you guys have in America, the credit score, okay? Yeah. We have something different in place here, but it's similar to that. And so it actually gives each male uh, a grade and whether it will, will be allowed in. And wow. it actually will tell you what type of potential phishing problem that email has, whether it's a business email compromise or not. So when my when my buddy earlier that I said who sent those Amazon that Amazon link to me, um, when he um, had that come through, Graphis would have picked it up because they would have known that it's not coming from his IP address. They would have looked at all these different attributes and realized this is not how he actually sends his emails, and they would have figured that out. But obviously, no solution in place. So. Um, but yeah, we've won quite a few awards recently. We're really proud of that. Um, I, uh, I won't say awards are the end all be all, but we took home best new solution at three shows this past year. 
um, which shows that obviously people are using our product and they're liking it. Um, you know, and getting our name out is a big thing. Yeah, like, like you mentioned, we're part of the Kaseya family, but a lot of people don't know Graphis yet. And that's why that's why they brought on the big guns right here, right? So. Hey man, Mr. Mr. Canada, Mr. UK, soon he's going to move to the US, watch, watch. Oh, wow. Or, wow. Austra or Australia. I just, I see him going the other way. Maybe it just keeps following. I, I, following. George, I've, I've actually lived in Australia. I lived in Melbourne back in uh, 2002. So I loved it. The weather is incredible. It's like living in, kind of Florida, LA all year. It's great. Uh, the food's good, but it's very expensive. But uh, no, I, I, I love Australia. I, that could be on the cards at some point for sure. Yeah. Just like when they're open, not when they're closed. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So back to us, but no, I mean, we, uh, we've been growing year. Um, you know, we've been around since 2015, but um, you know, until we kind of came into the Kaseya fold, nobody really knew about us. I mean, that's the one thing about scaling up your model is when you get in with a large company, you know, they have the resources that we don't have. I mean, I had never heard of Graphis before this. And now a lot of people are starting to hear about us. You know, we're doing events, we're getting out into the marketplace. And, uh, you know, if anyone ever wants a demo, reach out to me because I can sort them out. I won't be doing it. That, that, but, that's Miles, not Mike. Yes. Yeah. Don't talk Miles. to Mike. Mike, yeah. Mike is, uh, he won't help you. But, um, yeah. you know, like we, we base ourselves on, we have three levels of security and, that, that's what we do. And we get started up, we, we embed ourselves into the email system and within about five minutes, we're up and running and we're protecting right away. So that's kind of the quick elevator pitch on us for sure. No, it's, that's fantastic. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a lot of solutions out there. I think like a lot of people are concerned about now with email, right? Like all this additional stuff you have to do, DKIM and, and, and all these other things. And then like a lot of the email security products require you to change MX records to like route mail somewhere else before they get to the actual end destination of the email server. And I think the concern there is that if something's broken, right, in that that initial, you know, kind of lane, then the email doesn't actually make it to the end destination at all, which is a catch-22, right? You're like, hey, I want to be secure, but I also can't miss my messages. Yeah. Um, so well, like that's one of the main, that's one of the main concerns. I think people always talk about this type, type of stuff. Well, that's a great point. Like we don't, we don't make you change your MX records. Like that's not even part of the part of it. Um, the one thing I always say as well, I, uh, I still use hotmail for some of my personal emails, which I know everyone laughs at me when they see my hotmail address. I mean, it's mostly personal. I get my ticket master tickets on there. It's I've had it now for 20 years. It's easy. And they've just added a phishing button to the hotmail platform. And this was not here a year ago. So they're seeing, obviously, Microsoft is seeing that this is something that we need to do. So we're trying to help the end user from getting fished on their personal emails. And in the next 18 months to, I'll say, 24 months, every person will have some type of phishing solution either embedded into their personal emails, but more likely on their, um, on their work emails. Everyone's going to have something in place because phishing is now the the easiest way that these threat actors or cyber criminals or cyber attackers get in and breach systems. 43% of all breaches come from a phishing email. And I always love to leave listeners with this crazy note. Um, George, you're a smart guy. What is the GDP of the USA last year? Any guesses? It's in the trillions. I'll say that. 12 trillion. I don't know. Very close. It was 20 trillion dollars that's okay. not that close but okay yeah well, you, you were in you were in the realm i mean what's eight trillion between guys like me and you like that's pocket change all i right? know all i know is they seem to spend a lot more trillions than they make at, in any year but that's fine <laughs> exactly and you probably spend about eight trillion on on eagles tickets every couple of years so you know, you know what I, at least i know i'm spending it on something that i think is worthwhile that's all i got for you exactly exactly so 20 trillion is the gdp of the u.s in 2020 uh, China was at about 14 trillion. And by 2025, cyber crimes will, will be at about $11 trillion. So they'll wow. be the third largest GDP on earth. Um, and that's just cyber crimes. So it's pretty crazy to think that this is something here. It's here to stay. Cyber crimes are not going anywhere. Even when companies shut down, like, you know, the FBI shut it, shut down our evil, which is one of the big cyber, cyber criminal gangs. Um, another one will pop up. And so they realize this is big business. So sadly, if you don't have some type of solution in place, um, you're going to be going, oh, I remember that Miles guy telling me about that a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it's going to be something that everyone has. 100%. So everybody, 
if you have if you don't have a good email security solution in place or you think yours just isn't doing the job drop a line to miles online or check out graphics.com and uh oh, sorry Gra graphics.ai Ah, dot AI. See, I'm glad I, I, I put that out there. Graphics.ai. You just check it out. Maybe, maybe it's something that's interesting. I think the majority of the business world's on either Google Workplace or 365. I'm sure there's other email systems still being used out there, but I would say that those are the two most popular. So you know, give it a run. And obviously, if you're you know from the UK, Canada, or Australia and you want to learn more about those places, I think Miles could probably tell you a few things. Now, to Keith's point, you know, if you need to learn about NFL. <laughs> You can just give me a ring and, and no, I don't sit on the sidelines like you think Keith, but yes, money is an object. I just spend a lot of my working hours working to pay for my tickets, like an every day NFL fan. Uh, and yes, if I went back and I have at one point calculated how much money I spent uh, on Eagles related things, um, there are uh, quite a few zeros uh, more than I'm willing to admit. So uh, <laughs> Keith says he, he sits on the sidelines and, and, you know, does the scoreboard thing. Okay. Hey, listen, if you, you got to hook up at Jerry land, by all means rock on my friend, <laughs> everyone. I really appreciate you guys for jumping on miles. Um, I still think that there's an A team out there that can be put together. Right. You know, instead of the fake mass and the storefronts, they go after some of these bad guys, but until then some protections, good. Definitely check the, you know, that stuff out online. Thanks for jumping on today. This session was recorded. This is a pretty fun session. Uh, it'll be on msbinitiative.com. Uh, again, we do these one o'clock Tuesdays and Thursdays live, otherwise online 24 by seven. Catch you on the flip side, my friend. It's good, George. Great to talk. You got it, man.